He said, I want to get to know this man. So he came. I said, come over to my house for dinner. So last Tuesday, he had dinner at our house, and we met again. And uh, he shared his heart and his testimony. And, um, and, I, and then just, to, just so ha I thought, you know, I want to have him come share sometime. I'm glad Jessica and Rick are here because they're, they're called to be missionaries. Let me just say that's I want them to hear. And I'm sure you've heard many missionaries before. But I want us to hear his heart. And I want us to get a perspective. That we're just, America is Disneyland. We're 6% of the world. We live in Disneyland. This is not reality. We need to have our eyes opened. And we have to, we have to understand. Anyway, you're, I don't want to keep talking. I want you to hear Ramin. Ramin, come up. And everybody give him a God bless you as he comes up to, to, to talk. Hallelujah. What an honor to be here, and I want to thank Pastor Joe for allowing me to come here in the house and share. And uh, it's not too long ago that I know him, but we just suddenly became friends. And uh, it's just uh, awesome. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Amen? Amen? So it's just a pleasure to just share, you know, what God has done in my life uh, in past nine years that I gave my heart to Jesus. And uh, it's such a privilege to know Jesus. Amen? I was born and raised in Iran as a Shiite Muslim. And uh, as long as I remember, when I was um, 11 years old, I started practicing Islam. Because in Iran, everything is Islamic. Newspaper is Islamic. Um, the media is Islamic. The schools are Islamic. Society is Islamic. Everything you can see and hear is Islamic. And um, because they want to just indoctrinate you. And they want to brainwash you. And in the school, we had, you know, magazines and books that uh, basically showed the caricature of the Israeli soldiers killing uh, Palestinian babies, and they sowed the seed of hatred in our heart. So we start hating, and, and sh every morning we, we used to shout death to Israel and death to America. And as kids, in, in the cold winter time outside in the yard, in back of school, they lined up us and they asked us to curse Israel and curse America. And um, so as, as a child, we used to, uh, because they tell you when you're 11 years old, as a boy, you got to start practicing Islam. And, and the girls, when they're nine years old. Uh, so because Muhammad married a nine-year-old girl. So that's why they, they believe that girls are that, at that age, they're ready to practice um, marriage and practice uh, religion. So when I was 11 years old, I started practicing Islam and praying five times a day, fasting a month. During Ramadan, we could not eat before sunrise until sunset. And um, so it was so, for me, as a, as a human being, you know, everybody has a vacuum in the heart, you know. And I start searching and searching for the truth to see how I end up here. And since we, the only option we had was Islam, the only option, the only thing we could believe was Islam. So we believed it. And whether it's a lie or not, you believe it. Because that's, that's the only thing they told us, you know, Allah is, a, is God and you got to believe Him and worship Him and follow Him. So I started practicing um, when I was 11, fasting, praying. We used to, because we we're Shiites, we used to mourn for our dead Imams. So I used to walk on the asphalt, barefooted on the hot asphalt in the summertime, and beating our chest and beating our back with chains. And we used to put mud on our head and beat our head with hands. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, they used to put sackcloth and ashes. So we were moderate. We used to put the mud and beat our head with a heavy hand and beat ourselves. Do you know why? Because they told us if you do this, you gain, you gain points and you'll go to heaven. Maybe you go to heaven. And some people even use dagger. They had dagger and they hit their head and bleed because they want to please that, that idol to go to heaven. And from age 11 years and on, I started practicing Islam and got deep into it, deep into it, and deeper I got into it, into it God. It wasn't satisfying me, you, you, you never know how much is enough. And you pray, I used to wake up 5 a.m., go to the mosque and pray. It, it's rainy or snowy or you gotta go and pray and pray and pray and pray fast. In the school, they beat us to prayer. They ask us to go and pray in the schools. And uh, so I practiced that to, the, to my core of my being because I really love the Lord, I love God. And I wanted to please him, to know him. 
But that, that was the offer, no? They offered us Islam. They said, this is the truth, and you're going to believe it. And they told us, you know, Christianity is a lie, Judaism is a lie, only uh, Islam and the Quran, that's the truth. So, after some years of practicing Islam, and I got deeper into it, I used to go recite Quran. Have you seen they call for prayer? Yeah. And um, a friend of mine, his mother was uh, working in a, uh, uh, for the government in a company, and um, so they had us go and call for prayer, and calling, you know, on the uh, speaker for the whole city to come for prayer. So, and after years of practicing that, uh, some stuff happened in my life. I lost my father, I lost my school, my education, and my hope was evaporated. Everything I had was gone. And I started questioning my faith. I said, is this really the truth that we believe? Is that the, really the God that we, has made us and we believe in Him? So, I was qu asking questions, there was no answer. And little by little, I started getting depressed and down, and, and, and because God was my only hope, and He was the only thing I had. But when I found out that He is not the truth, that, that Islam is not the truth, and I was doubting it, I started going down and down and down. And hopelessness got a hold of me, and depression. I left all my friends, I left all my families, I left everybody that I knew, and I, I locked myself in a dark room, turned the lights off, and thinking about past and present and future. And thinking, you know, who made me? And where I'm gonna go when I die? When we had a funeral, we used to go to the, you know, on the street, uh, to the um, uh, cemetery and see people, people being buried. I was like shot to death of, of, of fear. And I said, what, what is gonna happen to me when I die? And I'm telling you, they're telling you crazy stories about when you die, what happens to you. So we're afraid and scared of death. And for two weeks I couldn't eat like something because I was so afraid. And I remember as a child when I was, to go, when I was going to the school, like I was a child, like maybe you know, 10, 12 years old, walking on the streets, I saw the hanging people on the streets, executing people in front of children. And we could not, no, I could not eat for two weeks. I was shocked. They're killing a human being in front of me. And then you go, Another day you see this, this somebody, they have somebody on a bed on his back and slashing him in the back because maybe he had drink alcohol or something. And according to Islam, the punishment is to be slashed. So they bring him to the streets to be basically, what do you call him, to be a, an example to others that if you do the same thing, that's what's going to happen to you. So you start beating people and, 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 and persecuting people and just crazy. For example, they, there's a police in Iran, they call them Revolutionary Guard or Sapa or Basij. Uh, they are a uh, paramilitary group, and when they come on the streets, if they see you have a shirt or t-shirt, or you have a picture on it or something, they can tear the shirt off on your, on, on your, that you're wearing. So do you appreciate the freedom you have here? <laughs> but nobody can tell you, okay, what shirt you have, what color you, you should wear, what you cannot eat, what you cannot drink. In, during uh, Ramadan, when they fast, if, if a restaurant will be open, they shut the whole restaurant down. They arrest the owner and they, they beat him with the slashes just because he's doing business in Ramadan. If you eat something, if you drink something, and they see you on the streets, they arrest you and they beat, and beat you. So you appreciate the freedom you have here. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. You have McDonald's open 24-7. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I was, after I practiced that and I came to conclusion that this is empty and I was day by day I was going down depressed hopeless turned the lights off thinking about past I said if there is no God then who made this creation who made the stars who made the heaven who made the humans who, who made that if there is no God if there is there is a God then why is not helping us where is he then and I was questioning God and, and then I almost lost all my faith in Islam but I was isolated, I was getting sick, and I could not eat, I could not drink, I could not sleep, maybe four, three hours, in, in 24 hours. And I was broken, I was hopeless. Because I said, what is the purpose of life? Why you should live 70, 80 years with hardship, and with labor, and pain, and you go to school, and you get married, and you have children, and you work hard, and then you, you make money, and you pay the bills, and then you die. What is the purpose of this life? And there's no answer. And I started asking God, God, who are you? Who are you? Show yourself to me if you're real. Tell me the truth. 
and there is no answer. And the only thing I had in that room was a satellite um, receiver that I could access to satellite dish. You know, in Iran, having a satellite dish is illegal, but everybody has it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they cannot, they cannot arrest the, you know, 70, 80 million people. <laughs> so if you go on, to, on, on the rooftops, you see all these satellite dishes. Because Iran has like 10, you know, 10, 7 or 8 or 10 uh, network uh, that, that are local and government controls them and it's all propagandas and lies and all Islam and they broadcast Quran and so forth. It's just headache and boring. So people tap into satellite because there they can watch movies and dancing and so forth. So they, they see all these Hollywood things and they think in America 24-7 people dance and sing and <laughs> <laughs> nobody works. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to Iran, you can find people with, with this, you know, the styles they have in Hollywood, but they can be arrested for that. And uh, so, what happened after uh, one day, just was you know, flipping through this channel, I came across a TV channel, and it was TBN. Was talk, a guy was talking about Jesus, that Jesus is the Lord. He died for you. He rose again. He's the Son of God. And as a Muslim, we were told that Jesus only was a prophet. He's not the son of God. He didn't die for us. He was only a prophet that came and he was a good person, did good stuff, and then he went and the next one came. So they diminished the, the, the position of Jesus. And um, so for the first time I was hearing that he's the son of God. He died for me because they told us he didn't die. They told us the story that um, when they came to arrest Jesus, they couldn't find him. So God made another Judas, the Iscariot, God made him look like Jesus. And they arrest him and crucify him. And um, so that was, I didn't know the story. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a Bible to know the truth. So we believed it. And then for the first time I was hearing that he died for me. He rose again. He's the Lord. He's the Son of God. So what happened? I rejected it. I said, no, that's a bunch of baloney. So I said, that's not religion again. And I turned the TV off. But it still was hopeless. It was broken. And there was no hope. There was no reason to leave. So thoughts of suicide started coming to me. I could feel darkness around me. I could feel the thick darkness around me. I could feel something is telling me to kill myself. And that the hatred and darkness in my heart. And um, so I was uh, getting sick and worse. I went to the doctor. I was losing, started losing my hair. And I went to the doctor. And they said, because you, are, you think too much, you're stressed out. You have, and that's why you're losing your hair and you're stressed out. And uh, so my skin was broken. My, my, my hair was falling. So then I... Um, I came back home disappointed, and then the thoughts of suicide got deeper and stronger. And I was thinking to kill myself. And one day again, just out of dispersion, I was just walking, watching this TV, and again I saw this guy talking about Jesus. That if you give your heart to him, he will change your life. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again from the dead. He is the Lord. And that day, I just opened my heart, and I said, Jesus, I do not know you. I've been told that you only were a prophet, but if you are the son of God, if you really died for me and you rose again, today I open my heart. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins. And I was repeating this prayer, and suddenly I started weeping and crying. And the heat went through my hand, warmth. It went through all my body. I was shaking and trembling. And such a peace and joy was in my heart. It's like somebody lifted off 200 weight of, uh, pound of weight off my shoulders. I was, I was about to fly. I was so rejoicing. And then I started speaking in tongues. Never knew anything about tongues. Never been in a church. Never was taught about tongues. And this word was coming out of me. It's like somebody was boiling inside of me. Just like on the day of Pentecost. And fire was upon me. I, mean, I was about to go and tell everybody, Jesus is the Lord. I wanted to go. I ran to my mom's house. I went to my mom's house. And, um, excuse me. I went to my mom's house, and I, uh, the, mo the moment my mom opened the door, because my mom was sick for years, and she knew that in what situation I was, I was depressed and hopeless and broken. And when she saw me, she said, what happened to you? I said, why? She said, your face is shining. So she could see God's glory and what happened to me in me. And my mom was sick for years. And I said, mom, I'm going to pray for you. I wasn't taught to lay hand on people. I wasn't taught to command in the name of Jesus. I lay hand on my mom and say, in the name of Jesus, I command the sickness to leave you. Instantly pain left her. Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah. 
So my mom was a devout Muslim. I mean, she was a devout Muslim. I used to read Quran for her because she couldn't read. I used to read Quran for her. We used to go to the shrines of dead imams. These dead imams who had these shrines, they built, like for example, there's a shrine here built like golden shrine. And people are poor and broken. And you had this golden shrine, huge building, shiny, huge. And we used to go to these buildings and, and throw the money in it. And they say, so and so imam used to walk here. So they build a place on their walk, on their footstep, and worshiping it, and asking for help from that footstep. I remember I used to ask my mom for like, you no, know, uh, for some money, and like she said, no, no money. And she would go and throw all this money into this thing, and I was thinking, mom, <laughs> and throwing all this money into that shrine, trying to get an answer for her prayer. No, my mom, I never knew, I, I, my mom was a very nice person. She never did anything wrong, as, as far as I know. But every time she was praying, she was crying and asking for forgiveness. You know what? Because she loved God. But, and she knew that she's not right with God. She knew that she's a sinner. She knew that she's not right with God. Her conscience was condemning her. And she was crying. And so was, so was other, other people, you know? We used to go to the shrines and beat ourselves and, and cry and weep and weep and weep. Sometimes go 24 hours staying in the shrines of dead imams, that bones. There are some shrines where you know, they have dead bones and uh, dead people that died centuries ago. And they said, like, this guy is a um, holy person. And we used to go and, and some people would go chain themselves to his place for healing. And they never would get healing. Can you imagine if an evangelist would go there and preach Jesus raised from the dead? Do you know how many people would be healed? Amen. To God with the glory. And it will happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Then I am. Um, so I was on fire for God. My mom got healed. My sister saw the change in me. I was so nice. Before that, I was grumpy. I was arrogant. I was hopeless. I was angry. Now my sister saw me so respectful, so nice, so kind. You know what? Because the life of God came in me. Amen. The love of God was shed upon my heart by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah to Jesus. So I went to my mom's. Uh, then uh, after my mom got he healed and she gave her heart to Jesus. She was a devout Muslim. I'm devout. She gave her heart to Jesus. And then I went to my sister saw the change in me. They said my, my, my mom was healed. They gave her, their heart to Jesus. I have six sisters. And I have uh, three brothers. Uh, one of my brothers gave his heart to Jesus. Two of them, I'm working on them. But what happened, after that, I started looking for a Bible. I went library after library, store after store, shop after shop, trying to find a Bible. I couldn't find one. Some people told me it's illegal. Some people told me it's distorted, it's corrupted, don't look for it. For three months, I looked for a Bible. I could not find one. I came on the internet, finally, because the internet is so slow in Iran. They keep it slow on purpose. They don't want people to access information. And so I searched for the word Injil, which means gospel, because they told us, you know, Moses brought the Torah, Jesus brought Injil, and Muhammad brought the Quran. And uh, so I searched for the word Injil, and the error came that access to this website is prohibited. They blocked the website. They didn't want you to hear the gospel. So I studied computer. Thank God technology was good for something. <laughs> so I, I used the proxy and I circumvented that and I found all these books. I found all these books that I, uh, and I saw, you know, the four Gospels. And I asked myself, why, why are there four? Because I thought it's going to be one of them. <laughs> and I saw four Gospels. I saw the book of Acts and Romans and First Corinthians. I said, who are these people? <laughs> and then I, I thought there were people named, you know? So I just downloaded the four Gospels. And I started reading the four Gospels, and it was like tears coming out of my eyes, weeping. I used to, after I got saved, I could eat easily, I could sleep like a baby. And then I started reading the Gospels, and it was like, I was 8 a.m. until sometimes that evening. I would read the, the Gospel, non-stop, and just reading. I was so soaked into it, and focused into it, that I was just reading it, and reading it, and reading it, and reading it. And I was, I was crying. I said, why this book should be illegal? There's nothing against the government in it. In fact, it says that give the Caesar to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. 
It doesn't say anything against the government. It says, if somebody asks you to go one mile, go two miles. Amen. It says, love your neighbor. And it's the message of redemption, resurrection, victory. You know, because in Quran, in Islam, it's all dead imams. So-and-so got killed by so-and-so. So-and-so died. And this is the tomb of so-and-so. That's the shrine of so-and-so. And it's all the message of defeat and destruction and death. But when I read the Bible, the Gospels, it was the message that Jesus conquered the grave. You know, when I was reading the Gospel and they killed Jesus, I was so, I got upset. I said, okay, they killed him. Because I, I couldn't believe it could be. I heard he rose from the dead and I believed it when I, when I gave my heart. But when they killed Jesus, I said, okay, I killed him. I said, why did they kill him? And then I came forward that Mary went to the tomb and the tomb was empty. Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Because the Lord is a reason. Do you know what makes the Christianity different than other religion? The very fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. All of the religion, they might look good and they may be sophisticated, but when you go inside of them, they're all empty, powerless. But Jesus conquered the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul says, death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your power? You know, I'm not afraid of death no more. As a child, I, I told you when I used to go to the tomb and to the cemetery, seeing people being buried, I was so afraid. But when I came to Jesus now, I know that death is only transition. You know, transition. You just walk out of yourself, you know, this, this corruptible body, and enter into eternity. Yes. Hallelujah. Living with Jesus. That's the message of hope. That's the message of hope that we carry inside of ourselves. And you know, millions of people need it. So I downloaded the four Gospels and I started reading them. And it changed my life. It, I was watching, I was weeping reading them. Not, not the, the tears of disappointment and hopelessness like before, but the tears of joy and victory. I said, why this book should be illegal? And I said, everybody should know this. So I started going to gym. I copied these uh, four Gospels on CD. And I started going to gym. And I would talk to like a young man and say, hey, this is Angel. You know, I read it, it changed my life. I gave my heart to Jesus. And uh, then other people like here that would hear me and they would come to me. They say, can I have one too? Can I have one too? Young people, 70% of Iranians are under age 30. That means out of 100 people, 70 people are under age 30, my age. Hallelujah to Jesus. And do you know they're seeking for hope? In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, You once were without God and without hope in this world. And that refers to everybody. People are without God and without hope in this world. Don't look at those people in Hollywood who come and dance and sing. They take 10, 20 pills to come to that. And afterward, they, they use drugs and alcohol just to keep up. And they end up killing themselves for suicide. But we have the true joy of the Lord. We have the true hope of eternity. Peter said the hope that doesn't corrupt is incorruptible hope of eternal life. Hallelujah. And then I was, I started giving it to people. People are hungry for God. After eight months, I got stabbed. Somebody attacked me with a knife. Before that, the Lord told me to leave the country. But I didn't have the money. I didn't have a passport. And one day I was walking, talking on the phone on these cabins on the streets. And the guy attacked me with a knife. The guy with a long beard. He attacked me with a knife and he stabbed me in my head. In my, I came, he was going to hit my neck and I came back and it fell. So my, my leg came up and he hit, in, hit my leg. So I had like 70 in inches in my, inside my leg because it was so deep. I was bleeding and the guy ran away. They took me to the hospital. My family sued the car because some people took the tag number. Some old people sitting there, they saw the car. They, they, uh, they got the tag number and we sued the car. We pursued it. And after a while, they destroyed the case. They said, don't, don't pursue this. They, they take away the case from, uh, from, the, uh, from the court. So I knew I have to leave the country. I was like 19 years old. I didn't have money. I didn't have passport. But God told me to leave. You know what? I didn't have the Old Testament. I didn't have the whole Bible. I just had the four Gospels. But when the, when the Lord told me to leave, later on when I came and read Genesis chapter 12, I felt the same thing that God told to Abraham. Leave the country of your father and your mother. Go to the land that I show you. I'll bless you and I'll multiply you and I will bless the world through you. 
I exactly felt the same thing. When I was leaving the streets that I grew up in, when I was leaving it, I knew that I'm not going to see this place for a long time. I knew it. And I didn't have money. I had $300. That's all I had. I threw some clothes in, in my bag and left. Nobody knew it, even my family. I came to the border. God miraculously passed me through the border. There are some smugglers, they smuggle people into Turkey. I came to Turkey. I didn't know where I'm going. Nobody was expecting me. Nobody was picking me up. <laughs> 19 years old, I'm walking to a different country with $300 in my pocket. And you can't spend $300 in, uh, in Turkey in three nights or less. So I walk into this country. They said, this is Turkey, go. And I walk into Turkey and I said, okay, what am I going to do now? And I went to just miraculously, I met this Iranian guy. And I didn't tell him, oh, I'm a stranger here, please help me, do something for me. I told him, do you know Jesus? And he said, no, but I'm going to a church. Would you like to come? I said, yeah. So he took me to this church. I saw for the first time a church. I saw people praising God and worshiping and singing and shouting. Because before we used to go to the mosque and cry and weep and beat our head and beat our chest and weep and people scream and cry. And... But for the first time, people were singing joy and happy. And so at the end, the pastor came and told me, what's your story? How did you end up here? I told him my story. He said, oh, praise God. God has called you. He loves you. So I became roommate with a guy in the church. He took me to his house. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So God knew. I had such a peace in my heart when I left because, you know, the gospel was on my computer on the city. I, I didn't know how to, um, I, I couldn't know, read it. So I wrote some scripture on paper and put it in my pocket. And I would take it off and read it on the way. And it encouraged me. Amen. And said, so, Lord, you have said to me to do this. And I'm trusting you. Yes. Hallelujah. So I came and, I, and I, was, I, was, I was so active in the church, going to all the meetings. Ladies meetings, youth meetings. <laughs> I was, I was at the door of the church, <laughs> and I was so active in the church. The church had 15 members. By the time I was leaving, the church had 150 members. Wow. All ex-Muslims. So we grow, and the Lord multiplied. We had, the church was a building, was a house. So we start knocking walls down to, to, to make space for people. And I'm telling you, it's not like here, you know, you turn the air conditioning on, you turn the heater on. When it's cold and you have nice pews and, and you have carpet and people vacuum it. No. We used to go buy coal and, and wood just to warm up for one hour or two hours. And when it's done, it's done. But we had, we had so much joy. We had so much hope. We had prayer meeting every day. We had Bible study every day, house to house. We used to walk and pray. Pray in the city against the powers and principalities. Pray for salvation of people. And the church was growing. So I was there. And the church, because I was illegal there, the church told me, if they arrest you in the church, they shut the whole church down. And the government is looking for an excuse to do that. So they, they asked me to go to the United Nations. I went to the United Nations an office. I told them my story. I told them I speak in tongues. <laughs> and the, guy, <laughs> the guy told me, which tongues? I said, tongues. <laughs> I said, Holy Ghost tongue. <laughs> so he, he wrote down everything I told him and then said, okay, I'll, we will call you. After six months, they called me. They, they asked me for an interview. They interviewed me. I told them the details of my story. I told them I believe in Jesus. That's how it happened to me. And they told us, we'll, we'll let you know the result. After six more months or eight, they called me and said, we have accepted you as a refugee. And then they gave me a phone number. They said, call this phone number and we'll let you know where we're going to send you. After a month, I called that number, and they said, United States accepted your case, and we're going to send you to America. I said, well, not bad. I'll go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is my witness. I didn't have even an ID card when I came out of Iran. I didn't have a way to go back. I didn't have an ID card. I had $300, and God brought me to America after two years. And there are people who, they have money, they have passport, they have everything, and they've been trying to come to U.S. for 15 years, and they haven't been able to. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, Paul says, Paul says to the Corinthian church, when I came to you, I didn't come with the man's philosophy and persuasive word of man. 
but I came with the power of the Holy Spirit, with signs and wonders. When we speak of Jesus, we have proof. We have proof that He has done in our lives. All of us in this room, we have tasted His goodness. So when I was in Turkey for two years, I was arrested four or five times by Turkish government. Do you know why? Because I gave the New Testament to people. I forgot to say this. The guy who took me to the church, he was not a believer. He said, I just go to church to see what Christianity is about. He gave me the first actual New Testament. And the moment I met him, he had one in his pocket. I opened it, he gave it to me, he said, you want it? I said, yeah. So I opened this Bible and I started reading it to see, make sure it's the same that I downloaded. So I saw the four Gospels and it was the same. And I saw the, the, those guys again. I saw Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians again. <laughs> I saw them, they're here. So I said, oh, they're here. And I went to the church and then I started distributing Bible. Of refugees, thousands of refugees there. We used to go give them Bible on the streets and tell them Jesus loves you, Jesus is Lord. And people start coming to Jesus, coming to the church. The church was the best place. The church was the bar in the city. The place that people can come and rejoice and have hope. And they start coming to the church and, and we give them Bible. And Turkish government arrests me five times for doing that. According to their constitution, it should be free. But who cares which constitution? Because it's Islamic government. People attacked us. One day, we're, because we're knocking down, uh, knocking down the walls, so we're working there, and then a guy was passing there, was a Kurdish guy. He said, what are you guys doing here? And we had a new guy who didn't speak much Turkish, but the word Kilisa means church in Farsi and in Turkish. So this guy just said, Kilisa. <laughs> he said, we believe Kilisa. And the guy went, came back with hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. He said, we'll kill you, we'll, we'll bomb you, we'll destroy you if you do this. And you know what? One mile away from us, there are bars, disco, they don't bother them. They told us you will corrupt our kids here because of, because of worshiping of the living God. So they told us we bomb you, we'll kill you if you do that. Press came, the secret service came, um, the, the news, news, news cameras was there, they were sh shooting us and so forth. They forced us to shut down the church. So we moved the church to another house, secretly worshiping God. I mean, we had people, families, the families had babies in their hands and walking on, on the snow for miles to come to church. Nobody had cars there. And yet, in America, when I came to America on the airplane, the Lord warned me, he said, when you go to America, be careful. When I was in Turkey, I was arrested four or five times. We had threats from the people, from the government. They threatened us to kick us back. They cussed at us. God didn't tell me to be careful. He didn't warn me. But when I came to U.S., on the airplane, the Lord told me, Son, be careful when you go to America. Don't lose your fire. Don't lose your passion. I didn't understand him what he told me that time. I really didn't understand him that time. When I came to America, I went to church. I, I understood what he, what he was talking to me about. I saw people coming late, leaving early. They have a coffee cup and they come and they just go, no passion. And Christianity was a part of life. But in Turkey, in Iran, it was all we had. It was all we had. We didn't have government assistance. We didn't have so-and-so medical service. We didn't have anything. And you have to rely on God. And Jesus was all that we had. And I came here, people had cars. And if it's cloudy, they say, oh, it's raining today. I'm not going to go to church. I said, what in the world? The days in Oklahoma, I was in went to Oklahoma. The days we had rainy, people wouldn't come to church because it was raining. And people with babies in their hands walk on five, six miles on the snow just to come to church to worship. And there was the threat of being arrested and being kicked out, and, but they would come and worship Jesus. When we went to the new house, we, we, we closed the windows. And summertime was hot and wintertime was crazy cold because it's in the line of Siberia. And we had to shut the windows and cover the windows with plastic and with curtains so people could not hear us. And we had to worship slowly, you know, low, so our voice could not go in you know, other places. Our church members, when they wanted to rent a house, they would ask him, are you Christian or Muslim? If they would say Muslim, Christian, they wouldn't give him a house. This is how difficult it was. But people loved the Lord to their core. They used to worship and praise God and thanking the Lord. Prayer meetings every day, walking on the street, fasting, praying, so on fire for God. And I came here, even people here denying God, acting against God. 
these humanitarian groups and uh, what do you call them, humanist groups and, and ACLU, what do you call them? Yeah. They're active against God. They're trying to take a cross off the streets or a... I said, you know what, you know what, what, what to tell them when they tell you there's no God? Tell him you kick him out of everything, out of the schools and army and all the public places, but he's in Iran working there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> he's laboring in Iran. He's saving people. Amen. He's alive. Amen. If they tell you, give me proof that God is real, tell him go talk to Ramin. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Gotta keep your fire and praising God and worshiping God and serving Him. Hallelujah. You know, America is the most dangerous place for faith to live, to be a Christian. Physically, it's safe, but spiritually, it's the most dangerous place because you have all this comfort. When you're sick, you go to 911, you go to hospital, you have medical, medical, what do you call them? You have insurance. When you don't have food, you, you go to the churches, the government, or whatever. But why? <laughs> when you're in Iran or Turkey or other countries, you have to rely on God. You gotta fall on your knees and pray. And seek God's face. Yeah. Seek God's direction. Because you can lose your life if you don't, if you, if you don't do that. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You're, you're living in the best place in the world. But you know what a good thing is? If, if you live in the best place in the world to live for God. Mm -hmm. To live godly. To come to prayer meetings. When I came to Pastor Joe's church. The church because I've been in a lot of churches. And it's dead. The churches are dead. They come one hour service. Yeah. 30 minutes. 10 minutes worship. 10 minutes announcements, yeah. and then they have a 15 minutes sermon it, and they go home. One hour. Mm. The seminary is teaching that. Oh, don't, don't go too long. Don't, don't worship too long. Don't talk too much. Yeah. And then, uh, but they go watch a movie for five hours. <laughs> when the new iPhone came, people go standing in line 24 hours in the line to get an iPhone, which they could get it next week or the week after. So it's not the problem with being getting tired and tired. The problem is people have been carnal and church has afforded that. And the church accommodated that and goes according to what people want. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. It's time to worship Jesus and praise Jesus. Amen. I have an online church on Saturday morning. People come, we start at 10.30 in the morning. Sometimes they finish at 2 or 3. People asking questions and they pray and they sing and because all they have is Jesus. Here you have to beg people to come to church. Jesus. You have to beg people to come to church. So after two years I came to America, I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Just God miraculously brought me there. And um, when I went to land in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I stayed with a guy that I knew for nine days. And then I became a lady in the church that I was going to. Her mother gave her a house, so she left the apartment she was in, but the uh, the lease was not over, so I went to the apartment and still paying the rent. And then a church heard my story somehow, and then they asked me to go and, and share. So I went to the church, I told my story, they, they heard, you know, my mom got healed, they didn't believe much in healing and so forth. So, uh, and they brought a letter to me, they said, this lady has breast cancer. And um, so, would you pray for her? I said, yeah, I pray for her. So I lay hand on her, I pray for her, I said, in the name of Jesus, I curse that cancer. I commanded to go and never come back. We believe and we receive. In Jesus' name, Amen. And she didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything. So service was over. Next week, they emailed me that the lady was cancer-free. They went to the doctor. There was no trace of cancer. Yeah. Hallelujah. And then that church asked me, what are you going to do with your life? And uh, I told them, I'm going to go to Bible school. And... Uh, and somebody took me to a Bible school. I had a dream in Turkey that I'm in a Bible school with thousands, with hundreds and thousands of people, uh, students. And I went there, and the Lord spoke, me, spoke to me, said, this is the school you have to go. And then the church, the church that I spoke on ended up paying for my school. You see how God provides? Amen. When I came to America, I didn't bring anything. I left everything I had for refugees, all my clothes, all my, everything I had. And I just brought uh, $100 or something in my pocket. And I, entered the United States with $100 in my pocket. And my pants was tore up in, in the air, airplane. And I bought a pants in Dallas airport for $75. I had $25, I came to America, Tulsa, with $25. Welcome to America. <laughs> but God has been faithful to me. God has blessed me. And God is so faithful. And He will be faithful. 
and He will accomplish the good work He began in me. Amen? Amen. This is the God we worship. This is the true God that we serve. God is reaching out to Muslims. They're, they're seeing Jesus in dreams, in visions. He appeared to people. Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I was nobody. And I still am nobody. But it's the grace of God that used... You know, the Bible says God picks the low things of the, the world. Despised of the things of the world. And He, and he glor glorifies Himself in them. And I'm one of those. And God is using me to reach out to the Muslims. My vision is right now to have a TV station, a 24-7 satellite TV that I can broadcast into these Muslim countries, tell them that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Do you know how many, how many believers, uh, there's statistics that in past six, seven years, more than five million people have converted to Christianity in Iran. But you know, they don't have a Bible. They don't have access to a Bible or church. You cannot imagine that you can go to a church in Iran. People go to, there's a church that, uh, there is a church there in Iran. People will line up to go to church. They'll turn them, turn them away. They say, go, because um, they're not allowed to allow Farsi speakings to come. There's a Catholic church that, um, it was an Armenian church because they were born in Christian homes. So for them, they allow them to have a church, but under control. So when Muslims come to go to church, or ex-Muslims, they turn them away. And the government asked the church, you have to give the names of the, all the people who come to church. Their ID card, their names. It's such a privilege we have. You come to church and praise God and worship Him. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. You have ushers, you have seats, you have pews, you have nice, you have water, you have coffee. And it's just so awesome. You have good preachers, good teaching, Bible schools. It's so amazing. God has blessed this country. And I pray for America every morning. Say, Lord, bless him. Continue to bless this country. Protect this country from evil, from atheism, from socialism, from communism, from Islam. You know, the enemy wants to take, this, take away this country from because America has been sending missionaries and supporting missionaries for the past hundred years or more. And Satan wants to destroy this country because it, if, if they do that, if Satan can do that, then it stops the mission. The TV that I got saved through was pioneered by American people, by American funds. If America would be broken, then the gospel would be limited. And God wants to use us. God wants to bless this country. You remember when God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham started interceding? He said, Lord, will you destroy this, this uh, city because of, if, if there are righteous people? God said, if, you know, if, if 50 people there, I will spare it. 45, 40, it came all to 10. And there was no 10 righteous people in that place. But God blesses America because of you guys. For the sake of the church, God is blessing this country. But it's limited. We've got we to gotta wake up. Yeah. If church goes to sleep, then God has no reason. There's no, nothing to hinder the devil to destroy this country. God wants to wake you up and to preach the gospel. When you go, everywhere I go, I preach the gospel. When I came to America, I went to Walmart. I saw Bibles there. I saw, I couldn't believe my eyes. I saw Bibles pile up on each other. And I look at it, is this is true Bible? Is it Bible? I saw Bibles in Walmart. And in Iran, for three months, we looked for a Bible, couldn't find one. And yet people would pass by it and buy magazines and other things, and they would look in the Bible. Hallelujah. Jesus is the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is the Lord. Amen. Say it. Say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah to His name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So just one thing I ask you, just to keep me in prayer for this open door for this TV station. Because that would, that would bless millions of people. See, the things I shared with you, I didn't share to condemn you, to make you feel guilty. But it's a wake, you know, wake up call. Yeah. And most of people in Christians in America, they have no fault because they haven't seen an example to fall on their knees and pray. I saw the picture of George Washington out there, mm -hmm. that he was on, on his knees praying on the snow. Yeah. That's how this country was formed, based upon yeah. biblical principle. Godly people who fall on their knees and prayed and intercede. The first Congress. People prayed for hours. 
And yet, a couple weeks ago, I saw they brought a Muslim to open in prayer in Congress. They're asking a false god for direction. That's why you need to pray for it. You know how much I prayed for this, this past election? I prayed for this election for almost six, eight months. I said, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you give favor to the people who are godly, who hate covetousness, who want to go and serve. I said, Father, give them favor. Help them to be elected. And remove from power the proud, the, the ungodly. And God did that. Right after election, four states struck down the gay marriage. They said the federal government cannot tell the, the state government what is the definition of marriage. Prayer works. Prayer works. Doesn't the Bible say, if, if my people humble themselves and pray, I will hear them and heal the land? Pray. And I was so happy when I came to this prayer meeting. Um, we came one, one morning at 8. We came here and I saw Pastor Joe and some other people sitting and praying, interceding. I was so happy. I was so happy. I said, praise God that there is a church that they pray. You know, most of the ch churches are, are closed these days. When I was looking for a building for our church in, in San Fernando Valley, I looked for three months for a church. They didn't, they, the churches didn't allow us to, to use our, their facilities. You know why? One of them told us you have to pay $1,200. $1,200 to, to be allowed to use our church for once a week. $1,200. I, I said, do you think we do business or something here? We have 20 people. We come, why not just come to worship the Lord? And you, you ought to support us. You ought to get behind us. I said, praise God. That's right. And you open a business here. You're asking for $1,200 for a church to be used? For a building that is not yours even? And I went to church after church. I went to another church asking for, for their place to be used. They said, okay, we've got to find out who you are. They searched my background. They told me, which school did you go to? And I told them. And then they said, okay, you, you believe in tongues? I said, yeah. I said, well, that's demonic. I said, no, you are demonic. <laughs> I, shared them, I shared with him my testimony. I told him, Jesus filled me with the Holy Spirit. He said, oh, no, those things passed away a long time before. I said, w w which verse says that? Give me a verse in the Bible. He said, oh, there's a verse. And he, I, I had my Bible. He brought a book, a book of another guy who, who wrote, and he told Brother Hagen, uh, he wrote about Brother Hagen that he was a false prophet or something. And I had my Bible. He had a book of a guy who wrote it. And he said, well, this book says, I said, forget that book. I said, what the Bible says? He said, well, there's a verse in the Bible. I say, are you talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8? That it says, whether it be in tongues which shall cease, whether it be prophecy will fail. Whether it be um, tongues and prophecy will fail, but love will last forever. I said that, 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 that verse is talking about that love, that one day we, not, we don't need tongues anymore when we go to heaven. Amen. We don't need prophecy no more. And it says, whether it be knowledge will vanish away. I told him, has knowledge vanished away? Both natural and supernatural? And he was shut up. But they didn't allow us to use their building. So, see, the church has become an apostate. That's the synagogue of Satan. So we've got to wake up and pray and worship God and, and serve Him. And go, go to the Walmart, share gospel with people. I've, since I've, been, I've come to America, I shared my testimony. I go to Walmart, people in the line, I'm telling the, the uh, what do you call them, the cashier about Jesus. I've led people to, to the Lord. And people behind us, and I'm holding that cashier's hand and praying and giving his heart to Jesus. Waiter, waiters and waitresses and go to the restaurants, talk about Jesus. Jesus. Share the, you never know. You never know. See, the guy who was preaching on TV, he didn't know he's changing someone's life Amen. by sharing the gospel. Amen. He didn't know. There are people, you might never know the things you say about Jesus. How can change someone's life? You, you might never know. You might never know. But one day you go to heaven and you see people come to you and say, you might not know me, but I heard you preaching yes. on that Walmart place. I heard you preach. I heard you talk about Jesus. You gave me a track. Do it. If all of us do our part, I promise you, we can preach the gospel. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you so much for having me here. And bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on. You're still here. Praise God. Amen. Now listen, I told you what happened.